Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. It's time for another week of craziness. I'm recording this on Monday morning. In about half an hour, I am headed into New York City for four days of, gosh, uh, two trade shows, quarterly board meeting, awards dinner, blowing off a political fundraiser, and I also have to skip a Senate hearing that I'd really like to attend but was not asked to be a witness for, thank God, um, but can't. Um, but I do have two D.C. area visits on the schedule for next week, so, you know, that'll make up for the... Uh, uh, any amount of soul that I start to regenerate over this current week. Uh, on the plus side, I am still ahead of the game when it comes to the virtual memories show. Uh, there are two more episodes in the can, so I am keeping to my New Year's resolution of not going into a week having no idea who the next guest will be. Um, the other New Year's resolution I've kept up with is dropping 15 pounds, which I've I've actually managed to pull off and and feel pretty good about. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, uh, while it's a good thing that I get the show backed up uh, and and get episodes, you know, prepared in advance, the downside is um, it occasionally means that a show I recorded a while back has to wait. And that was the case with this week's guest. I got together with Tony Tulatamuti in mid-February to talk about his debut novel, Private Citizens. And it was a fun conversation, but the thing is, I only got to edit the the episode this past weekend, so I sort of forgot what we got into and, and you know, how engaging a talk this was. Um, now, I know a lot of you paused just there when I said debut novel because you have heard me bitch and gripe about young writers, particularly younger than me, who go to MFA programs and actually manage to accomplish something just because they're far younger than me and managed to get over their anxiety and actually write a book. Um, I know what you're saying. Don't you hold that sort of stuff in disdain, Gil? Aren't you that terrible a person? You're right. I do. And I am. Um, but that's why I'm glad one of my listeners actually turned me on to private citizens. Uh, Garrett Zecker, who was a longtime listener who I hope to meet up with someday, uh, he studied with Tony and suggested I get him on the show. Now, for the aforementioned reasons, I was pretty suspicious. Uh, but I checked out a recent opinion piece that Tony had in the New York Times about well, it's from last December, about why there's no millennial novel. Um, I really dug that and his his thought processes behind it and decided to give Private Citizens a chance. Uh, turns out it's a fantastic novel. Um, I enjoy the living hell out of it. It's about, if it needs to be about anything, uh, four recent Stanford grads around 2007, just a few years after they, they finished college. And um, the weird intricacies of their lives around each other and the rest of the Bay Area. And, um, well, it's got gorgeous writing. The characters are insanely compelling, not exactly redeeming, which is great. Uh, the plot is relatively twisted. But most importantly, it's um, it's got legit human feeling. And I just got swept along by this book. I foisted it off on a few pals of mine. They've already sung its praises. Uh, so I'm really happy that, that Garrett got me out of my bubble on this one. And I was happy to meet up with Tony in Brooklyn for a, a conversation. Uh, Private Citizens is out in paperback now as an ebook, of course. Uh, it's published by William Morrow. And the author's name again is Tony Tulatamuti, um, spelled just like it sounds. Uh, 
Now, our only caveat here is Brooklyn got a Brooklyn. Um, there's car noise, sirens, big booming car stereos, uh, and other noise coming from outside. You'll deal with it. Now, here's Tony's bio from his website, TonyTula.com. It's written in the first person. I've written for the New York Times, Vice, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Republic, N Plus One, Playboy, The Paris Review, and elsewhere. I come from the Pioneer Valley in the Bay State and used to work in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. For some reason, I've received an O. Henry Award and a McDowell Fellowship, and I appeared as a guest on Late Night with Seth Meyers. I work in New York. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Tony Tulatamuti, where we start off talking about the opening to my conversation with Clive James. But I did start off, James, with, instead of the reverent, so you've written this wonderful poem about dying and this, that, and the other, I was just... So besides Game of Thrones, what else do you regret you're going to die before you see the end of? And he just, oh, okay. You know, was much more at ease and, and ended up talking much longer than he thought he was going to. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's always the best way for an interview to go, I think. Like when you sort of um, address the person as a person instead of the person as a career or as like a yeah. sort of appendage to a literary work. You know, I mean, even if you buy into the whole like, yeah, the artist is just a wreck that follows their yeah. work around kind of idea but um yeah definitely uh there's there's nothing more destructive i think than when you start to see yourself from the outside which is exactly what you're inviting into your life when people start reading your work your published work right um and you have no idea where they're going to take that and especially with the internet where you can sort of select a context for um the, anything that you choose to think or uh read about somebody um you know, people can get funny ideas about you. Actually, let's dive in with that. Um, with Private Citizens, one of the, the major characters is a, for, from something you've talked about in past interviews, a sort of, uh, we'll say an alternate Tony or a, a, a more abstracted Tony. Does it make it difficult for a reader who doesn't know you, story, ethnicity, etc.? cetera? How, yeah. how aware were you of that in the process of writing this in terms of balancing the who I am as the author versus this work being able to stand on its own. Yeah, I think one of the great liabilities of um, writing a novel is that you know that your name is going to be on the cover, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if it's a conspicuously uh, female name, if it's a conspicuously ethnic name. I always uh, grew up Curtis Sittenfeld. I always, I always think it's a guy. I always have to look back. Oh, that's yeah. right. That, that's, or the George yeah. Eliot. Or, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is as a workaround. This is why so many people have written under uh, either pseudonyms like, you know, James Tiptree Jr. or mm -hmm. um, with the initials instead yeah. of uh, the actual name. But you can't hide Tula Tamuti. And there was some pressure uh, to sort of to change the name or to shorten it to Tony Tula. The thing is, you know, I had to just do my best to anticipate um, and sort of swim upstream against what I knew were going to be presumptions for people going into a book like this, right? Um, with a conspicuously ethnic name, people are just going to assume that uh, you're going to write about your ethnic experience because this is what, you know, for your whole um, kind of Bush League writing career, you're encouraged to do, write about your personal experience. And for writers of color, this amounts to like, Right about how you're different than white people, right? Mm -hmm. So um, knowing this, like I, I created this character as uh, somebody that m would be obviously taken as an author surrogate or doppelganger. Uh, and I baited people even more by giving him so many salient sort of author details. I took the, the autofictional approach where instead of kind of demurely abstracting this character away from myself, I'm just, um, you know letting people uh, draw this connection and then kind of punishing them for it, right? Uh, I've, I've written before that this is the same thing that Philip Roth does uh, in a lot of his, you know, what would now be called autofiction, but was called metafiction before, right? Mm -hmm. um, or... You're uh, thinking the Zuckerman ones or particularly the, the counter life and things where he, where Philip Roth Yeah, or Operation character. Shylock or, yeah. right. Um, well, that one was also partly driven by a, a halcyon side effect. But, but anyway, that's... that's <laughs> totally. Um, I'm sure and, you, you know, yeah. 
Right, and I'm not anywhere near as like you know uh, visible or as in the limelight uh, as Philip Roth. But what I'm responding to is just the, the name Tool to Moody on the cover of my own book, right? Mm -hmm. um, Will's name is effaced from the book for that uh, reason. All you get, all you get about it is its length, and a kind of drawn out argument between him and his girlfriend about shortening it, right? So I feel like I can. That's all I can do uh, as a novelist to. Uh, to get around what I know are going to be the most common knee-jerk responses to uh, to the book and its author. Mm -hmm. and the book's been out for about a year. Reception? Reaction? I mean, we're not living in a mansion here, obviously, but, you know, still. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think that it's, it surpasses uh, what I expected, but, you know, it's not anywhere near what I hoped, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think that's a pretty common experience for any like mid list writer. Um, so I'm, I am really only interested in like intelligent critique, right? Stuff that I think, um, doesn't engage the, with the book on any kind of interesting level. It doesn't matter if it's praise or if it's a pan, you mm -hmm. know, I just know that they, they read another book, right? Or, they are bringing importing stuff into their reading of the book um, that has less to do with, with the book and more to do with them, right? Yeah. Uh, and so when I read the most common sorts of uh, criticisms that are like, you know, this, all the, the main characters are really unlikable millennials and they're all millennial archetypes, right? Then I know that they didn't, they weren't able to read beyond uh, the conspicuous millennial signifiers that I give to these characters that, and, and so it's not something I have to pay attention to. Right. Um, I work on a book for seven years and, you know, I want somebody to do seven years worth of a hatch hatchet job, if that's going to be the case. And I am perversely flattered by people who are able to, uh, you know, to, to get through the armor plating like that. Right. Um, you know, if uh, if it's a pan and has a point, then I'll, all I can kind of do is shake my head and like salve my wounds, right? You got me. Yeah, yeah right. What, what took? Well, without asking in a, a derogatory way, what took seven years? Um, well, I mean, it takes two years for the book to even get on the shelves after you sell it, right? right? It took seven years because I was working a full time job first when I was starting it for the first two or three years, and I was really just being a weekend warrior, you know, yeah. unlimited nights and weekends. Um, and after that, I got to go to Iowa and uh, I got a huge amount of writing done there. The problem is I just did way too much of it, right? I mean, the first draft was about 900 pages long. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was an entire year spent just leaning on a delete key, um, line after line, uh, and letting whatever words I could go yeah. uh, without uh, losing the, the sort of bigger outline of what I was going for. What do you most regret having to cut? Um, or is it going to make its way into a future book? No, I think that it, it really it disciplined me. I'm mm -hmm. actually grateful for uh, this constraint, some of which was a chilling effect. You know, like uh, I know that I just knew that it wasn't going to um, to fly to, to come up with this like 900 page debut novel that on some level I knew it didn't have to be that long. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, a, a lot of it was showing off and a lot of it was... Um, sort of too clever by half formal experimentation. Um, uh, that said, it's only, there's only two things that I actually regret about the book. Um, one is I did lose uh, all of the interlude scenes um, later on that sort of flash back to their life in college mm -hmm. were written in originally what I wanted to be like the apocalypse of the epistolary form. I wanted to use every single possible trope and then some that can be done when you have a document inside of a of a book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had something like five different font colors with uh, <laughs> marginalia and then comments on the marginalia uh, and then cross outs. And you don't actually know who's uh, writing the cross outs or the comments on any uh, so, like, you get, the, you get the House of Leaves, the, the David Foster Wallace, and the Richard Flanagan Gould's Book of Fish, which yeah. is a nice, uh, nice third one to bring in. Right, there. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to destroy all of it. I just wanted to end it. Uh, and I realized that this was this project was uh, outside of the parameters of the book itself. You know, it wasn't necessary. It was just 
another type of thing I found interesting that I wanted to do in the book. But, you know, I do regret all the work that I put into it, just sort of being thrown out and going into conventional backstory. Um, I, you know, I found different ways to, to, to play with the authorship of that, those pieces. But, um, the other thing was that, uh, I was just persuaded. I can't remember who by, if it was like a, my agent or editor, but, um, uh, I was persuaded to tone down some of like the racial epithets. Um, there's one in particular where it said, uh, well, in the book now it says, you know, another uh, Asian eunuch, um, you know, like when Will is thinking about himself, right? Like he didn't want to be another Asian eunuch, but he didn't want to join this, join this boys club of masculinity that he was anyway excluded from either. He originally with Dickless Chink. You know, uh, dickless chink, it just sounds better for one thing. Uh, it's way nastier. And these are the terms in which he's uh, thinking about himself. He's internalized, uh, you know, racist perceptions of him. So that was way more honest. I got my arm twisted to change it and I wish I didn't, you know. Um, but other than that, the stuff I deleted, it wasn't a ton of scenes that I lost. Um, mostly if, I'm very loath to throw away stuff once I've like produced it. Uh, that is plot ideas and characters because they're, I come by them so with so much difficulty. Um, so I just instead just try to make them work. And usually what happens instead is this, I merge things, you know, I had two characters in a book, uh, in this book, um, you know, one was named Linda and another was named Sarah Jane. And one was a kind of like meek, uh, writer but with like a sort of inflated ego and another was just like a sort of um uh really nasty party girl right and and eventually i'm just like it's more interesting when this is the same person yeah um so i didn't lose it i just lost the name you know uh those two people became one person one more interesting person how crippling was your self-awareness (laughs) <laughs> of, the pro- of the project or were you young enough that it was you know no, this is a challenge not not yeah. you know paralyzing anxiety you'll yeah. get to paralyzing anxiety when you hit your 40s trust me that's that's if you're not there already but. yeah um you know i wouldn't say paralyzing because you, I, this is something that every writer goes through and in my case it ends up just being a an exercise in generating material you know <laughs> i mean the neurosis being the kind of shared trait between all four characters um a big appeal of writing. I don't see writing as a therapeutic activity. I just actually just see it as kind of like exhibitionist wallowing. But uh, I do think that it feels really good when uh, you take something that in your life that was in itself just a waste of time and are able to avail it to like a higher purpose, right? Who were you before you became a writer? Oh, um, a lot of things. Uh, I was definitely a really uh, desperate joiner. Um, I wanted to uh, win the validation of approval of the the culture I, I, that I lived in, right? Um, Western Massachusetts, I grew up uh, there, you know, um, just really close to Hampshire College where you went. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I was... Uh, one of the only Asian people in all the schools that I went to there. Um, at Stanford, you know, uh, there were a lot more Asian people there, but I still hung out, I feel like with mostly, you know, maybe like a 75, 25 split of like white to non-white people. Um, Mm -hmm. and the literary scene there, um, was overwhelmingly white. And then the instructors were uh, majority white as well. Right. So when your taste is formed in this environment, um, you can be at the time you're thinking like, I just want to write well. Um, but what exactly people are asking for, uh, or defining as good writing, um, uh, cloaked in all kinds of euphemisms, like universal writing, powerful writing, you know, um, Mm. uh, writing with heart, uh, usually boils down to, uh, something like relatability or interesting interestingness right so it's only when you write something that can be extremely relatable to this uh white audience or uh that's something that satisfies or indulges uh, a taste for exoticism or even kind of like a cultural pity um 
was stuff that um, I didn't know was steering my sensibility so strongly uh, until I got a little more outside of it, mainly through the, the help of my uh, writing friends from Stanford. Um, these are mostly Asian writers like uh, Jenny Zhang and Alice Ola Kim, uh, Anthony Ha, Karin Mahajan. Um, and uh, we sort of kind of came to these realizations uh, one after another um, when we realized that the feedback that we were giving each other and the readings we were giving each other uh, were a lot different than the ones that we were getting in the sort of standard workshop system. In the sense of, and I, I, don't, I apologize if I'm misreading it, but in the sense that, oh, you're Asian, therefore your literature should be touching on the Asian American experience. Yeah, right. From the, from the white person, you know, kind of pushing that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, the, and the double mind, of course, is yeah. that we do want to write about that stuff. Yeah. And we, of course, it's uh, worthwhile to talk about. And uh, yet there's something really distasteful about uh, being goaded in that direction. Yeah. You can uh, be our Asian token card. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, or uh, knowing that uh, you're satis satisfying some kind of um, quota when yeah. you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, every Asian writer that I know uh, wrestles with this, uh, uh, this, this, this self-presentation problem a lot, you know. Um, I know writers, and I've been guilty of this myself, where, where they get into these um, strategic calculations about how they'll, you know, how many Asian people will there be in their book? Should the protagonist be half Asian? You know, <laughs> like, and it, it's it's ridiculous. You should obviously uh, write whatever you want, but with an awareness that people are going to approach it in a certain way. And I'm not a writer who's satisfied by uh that that he's ever free of any kind of influence, right? I want to engage it. Uh, this the the compromise in this book. It's not a compromise. The, my my workaround in this book is um, that there's one Asian character and three white characters, right? Um, I think that uh, I had a lot of anxiety about this because I thought, why am I shortchanging Asian people? Why am I making them a minority even in my own book, right? Um, when I don't have to do that. Um, but on the other hand, this is a book about, about privilege and loneliness, you know, um, that, uh, his issues with, uh, ostracism are a lot more legible, uh, in, in a white context, right? The famous, I think Zora Neale Hurston quote, right? That, uh, I never feel so black as when I'm thrown against the sharp white background. Mm -hmm. Um, and don't know. I don't know who actually said that. I think it was Sir Neil Hurston. We'll look it up. The internet means anybody can say anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. That was yeah. my quote. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask the the decision to set the novel in like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, which makes it contemporary by some standards and absolutely like prehistoric by internet time standards. Oh, yeah. um, what led to that? That decision and sticking with it over the years it took you to, to, to write it. Did yeah. you feel tempted at any point to say, oh, maybe this would be better after the financial crash or after the invention <laughs> of this or that or the other? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, I started it there because I, I started the book contemporaneously. Uh, the project was to just write and record um, and entomb all of the, the sort of thoughts and preoccupations and perceptions I was having at the time. I started it in 2008, uh, early, right? So... It was a contemporaneous novel while I wrote it and took so long to write that um, uh, that uh, it became a period piece. Um, and I'm totally fine with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm fine with Pride and Prejudice being set in the 19th century, right? Um, it it's, comes from a certain time and place. Uh, that said, when you work on something long enough, uh, a big part of it is figuring out a justification uh, for the arbitrary decisions you make early on, right? Like, um, you, I name my characters more or less arbitrarily, and then if it doesn't fit the character that I come up with, then I tweak it, and uh, or I or I tweak the character. And it's the same with the setting too. When I I eventually I had to think about why it necessarily had to be set at this time period, and you know, the, I I lucked out in a lot of ways, you know. Um, Technology being a big theme uh, of the book. I was working in Silicon Valley then. Uh, and, you know, to your question about who I was before I wrote the book, mm -hmm. um, I was also pretty much not a writer in terms of 
how much time I spent uh, on one or another thing. Um, I focused on writing a lot in college, but afterwards, you know, I had a tech, I had two tech degrees, and um, I went into Silicon Valley as a user experience researcher uh, for a number of companies. So, um, you know, nobody was really encouraging me to write except for my writing friends. Um, and I was making plenty of money in Silicon Valley. Um, so, uh, 2007 ends up being an incredibly pivotal year in, uh, the mainstream adoption of consumer technologies, uh, that are just infrastructure now, right? Like smartphones, um, or, uh, the sharing economy or, uh, Twitter, I think launched that year. Um, I think Facebook opened up to the public the year before, right? Um, so San Francisco is where all this stuff is coming up and ends up being, um, uh, prescient about it in a way while at the same time also adopting its excesses, the stuff that doesn't quite make it through percolate out to the mainstream. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it made for a really good backdrop for, um, uh, what is a pretty antic novel, I think. Were there aspects of what you were doing in Silicon Valley that at all influenced how you write? Not yeah. in terms of content, but like the the perspective and, and how you worked? Oh, yeah. The overwhelming disgust, for sure. <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking more in terms of the, like the, the meta-conceptual vibe, but yeah, disgust <laughs> is a good thing, too. So. No, I mean, uh, I, it was a, what, I was in what they would call a really bad culture fit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, coming from the East Coast, uh, and also, um, uh, coming from a, a position of deep skepticism about, uh, the efficacy, you know, I was one of these people who were very well paid and believed almost not at all in, um, the project of what they were doing. Um, even if I, uh, believed in the, you know, revolutionary, emancipatory potential of technology. Um, the work I was doing didn't even affect it that much. I was enhancing the, you know, efficiency of login forms. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, a lot of, um, my discomfort and, uh, really disdain for, uh, the uncritical attitudes, uh, towards everything just from like, the importance of design, you know, people wearing t-shirts that said design will save the world, right? Um, to, uh, you know, the overblown importance of, you know, minor technological steps forward or new services or things like that. Um, uh, combined with the extremely bright-siding, brooking no criticism rhetoric uh, that it all comes wrapped in. Um, I had to, you know, put this in a, in a, my little jar of hate called private citizens, <laughs> right? Uh, because all I was seeing was, uh, the ways in which, uh, it was, uh, it was all just a vector for the worst tendencies of like neoliberal society, right? Privatization, um, privilege, the, you know, uh, the, and also just the, you know, the isolating, uh, qualities of, of these services, right? Um, you know, I had to, to go to work and draw a paycheck. Um, but, uh, I, you weren't part of the, the mission you felt. Right. I was, I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, sound ungrateful for the people who are, you know, paying me a wage or, uh, or even to dismiss, uh, the many, many good things that technology does, uh, uh, give us, you know, um, my dating life has been almost entirely mediated <laughs> through the internet. Right. Uh, but I think, you know, there's, there's not really a space for, for criticism or for doubt or equivocation. Uh, and, uh, I had to, I had to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Were there moments watching Silicon Valley on HBO that you thought, shit, I have to cut that scene from the, the novel or did, did you have anything that overlapped with uh, it? No, my, my book came out. <laughs> Well, my book was done and off to the printers before that before show, the show started. started. Right. But I will say that that shows a documentary. You know? yeah. That's <laughs> the vibe I've gotten from people. Yeah, right. I mean, it, we're 
uh, this has been said year after year, but you know, you can't do satire on a hyperbolic society, right? Um, it's, uh, it's so, so many things are so absurd that you usually have to tone them down for the sake of plausibility. Um, and I had to do that uh, a lot in my book, but at the same time, the book, it still got criticized for being uh, satirical. Yeah, yeah. Or now also over the top, right. Yeah. Um, uh, extreme in different ways. And, you know, uh, there's if only, no, nothing if only implausible. people knew, right. That, that there's actually very little implausible in the book yeah. at all. Right? Reading it myself. I thought, yeah, no, I could see that. Yeah. You know, perfectly. One of the interesting things to me, uh, when we talk about the, the contemporaneousness of it or the, the, um, the nature of the, the, the characters, I'm about 15 years older than you. And, it struck me very similar to 1994 and 1996 when I was about two years out of college and the movie Kicking and Screaming came out, uh, not the Will Ferrell uh, soccer one, but, but right. the Noah Baumbach one. Um, that vibe doesn't go away. Being 25 or 26 or so and, and being just out of college and not really knowing exactly what the hell you're doing, the historical circumstances are weird, the technology is different, but the, that human um, uprootedness is one of those things, or at least that American uprootedness is one yeah, of those things. Yeah, or just universal. that phase of identity formation, yeah. right? Which, you know, has been around at least since teenagers were invented, yeah. right? Um, that uh, you are self-sufficient uh, and yet, like, not necessarily equal to a lot of, like, the adult demands being made on you. Um, and even less so, you know, on the precipice of a financial catastrophe, right? Sure. Um that essentially turns you back into to children of your parents. Right, yeah. yeah. And the yeah. funny thing is, I haven't read a lot of uh, what people call these voice of a generation novels. Like, mm-hmm. I haven't read Less Than Zero or um, Generation X. Um, so if I came by uh, these tropes, uh, you know, they're either, they've either saturated, you know, either li- literature or uh, public discourse so much that I just came by it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, or there's just something there that, is easy to latch on to uh, uh, narratively that you don't even have to read your, your yeah. predecessors. Really. Yeah, and I think that's more the case that it's, it's not that those guys created some scenes so much as that is what we all go through. Yeah. If, and if I, we're privileged enough uh, to go. Yeah. Through. And I want to stick an asterisk on this and uh, because I wrote an essay about uh, voice of a generation novels for the times. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't at all believe that there's actually such a thing uh, as a novel that speaks for, uh, literally everybody in a we'll, in we'll a say you were using air quotes when you when you said uh, novel of a generation yeah. Yeah. yeah uh and to you know to claim that you speak for really anybody uh, other than just like the few people in your novel um is really presumptuous and ludicrous when uh critics attach it to a book like mine you know i'm really just writing about my own experiences um did you cringe when the the book jacket copy had mentions it as middle March for millennials. Did, did that really give you a, Oh God. <laughs> yes. But at the same time, like I, I also, March. yeah. I, like I also just like, Hmm, money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the things you have to do for marketing is, is one thing, but, but yeah, I, I, it was one of those moments that put me off temporarily from, right, from yeah. starting and it. When it's I saw also that, like, like two oh. lines below a comparison to this side of paradise. So it's just like already a muddled, yeah. uh, like, you know, <laughs> system of references there but that's a nice place to be put i i figure that's a lot better than you know yeah yeah this is a new novel debut author blah 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 so you know at least they put yeah, you on good whip, wait whip whip smart and razor sharp that's yeah. what they always say it's <laughs> any debut novel is always either whip smart or razor sharp yes i go with anxious and self-aware which is unfortunately my why i never get around to writing which is actually a question i had for you uh, as part of the who were you before you became a writer um I think it was an interview, maybe a, a essay you'd written. You you once said, "I feel like I had the talent to write, but a total inability to do it." What changed? Where did you? Uh, I guess it's still getting back to that question of actually becoming who you are. Yeah. Uh, so I had written a book of stories before this, um, a book's worth of stories, I should say, because I was by no means going to uh, force come out anybody. with this book. Yeah, I yeah. that that I knew was just like covered in. Uh, shame and pandering and stuff like this. Uh, uh, the thing that changed was that I figured out how to get humor in, into my writing. Um, I think that uh, part of what I imbibed as like 
uh, the hallmark of, of good, lasting, universal writing uh, was that it was a real bummer. You know, that yeah. uh, the comic novel and comedy in any uh, narrative genre really always gets shortchanged. Like, name five comedies that won the Best Picture Oscar, right? right? You, it's probably just Annie Hall. Um, and uh, I, I, I was so um, keen on respectability um, for such a long time that it, without my knowing it, this is exactly what it's like blocking me. Uh, there's no way to write about um, millennials without getting into a comic tone, right? Um, or at least uh, treating itself seriously. Yeah, as not that I was self consciously writing about millennials, right? Yeah. But, you know, I, I just kept on thinking, like, how do I write about Silicon Valley in a tragic tone, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's doable, I think, but that's not those what at all what I thought was salient about my perceptions. Mostly it was absurd what I was seeing, right? Um, so, you know, it, I, I had to, I wrote a novella um, before this book that was sort of kind of comic. It was like uh, I was getting comic beats uh, into the writing, uh, but it was still more or less a tragedy. And eventually I just started, uh, well, I've always liked love stand-up comedy and I just kind of immersed myself in it for like a long time, uh, going to open mics and uh, listening to albums and podcasts and all these things. Did you and perform also? No, okay. no. Uh, but my next novel is going to be about stand-up comedy. So um, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I don't know. I also re read some writers that did it really well, like Alistair Gray and uh, Martin Amis. Um, uh, I think I read that's J.P. Dylan Levy novel called The Ginger Man um, that were all just really body and uh, did it very well. Actually, to be honest, my, my biggest influence would probably be my friend Jenny, um, who has always written very funny stuff about um, uh, what you would think were serious contexts, like, you know, um, immigrants from China fleeing the Cultural Revolution. But uh, she's also, always been incredibly filthy and funny. Um, so uh, I think, you know, just percolating on that for a long time um, uh, eventually gave me the wherewithal to, to, to try it myself. And things were a lot easier after that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was uh, the reluctance to um, be cruel to my own characters, right? And not cruel in a way that would elicit um, pity. Uh, but would, stuff that would make them, and by extension me, look bad, mm -hmm. right? Or look unrespectable. Um, like one of the characters' massive, massive obsessions with porn? Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. right. I mean, that was Which one was of the, the first funniest parts. part of the book, of course. That's one yeah. of the first parts of the book, also, yeah. that, that got the thing off the ground. That yeah. uh, it wasn't even attached in any way to the narrative. And right now, it's even kind of a free-floating set piece. Um, that... Uh, you know, I just wanted to write something mind-blowingly filthy, right? Uh, that also sort of was a side effect of uh, thinking about sex scenes and scenes of romance and being like, I don't have the experience to write this stuff convincingly. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to write bad sex because that's, that's what I know, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know... That, but you do well, you, you know... Uh, it's not to say you're writing badly about sex, but you write yeah. great bad sex scenes. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, just the maestro <laughs> of bad sex. Um, so, get you know, getting shed of all of these uh, inhibitions was really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a change in values and a change in mm -hmm. genre, uh, and you know, figure I, I, none of it was fun. I didn't have fun writing it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was still murder once I figured out my way into it but um you know I, at least i did it um it just took a long time what did your parents think of the book i don't think they've read it okay uh you know we can I, we can avoid talking about no, that no, if no, you don't no. want to that's cool this is totally fair game i think <clears throat> um it's a really interesting phenomenon to have uh immigrant parents um who speak fluent english but um you know probably wouldn't be able to read uh, a more difficult like literary novel. And I wonder all the time to what extent I, I came to writing because uh, it was a way to like encrypt my expressions from my parents, right? Like, or to, to make myself unhenpeckable in a way. Um, 
uh, I, you know, I fear them and I crave their approval and, uh, you know, I owe everything to their support. They, they were, they were never discouraging me from being a writer when they realized it was what made me not happy, but <laughs> it was what, what yeah. fulfilled me, what I wanted to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it would, I would, I think a lot been a lot more difficult if, um, I thought that they were going to, uh, uh, be an active audience yeah. for the book, right? Um, I would, I think, be way more hesitant in 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 watching what I say. And but they get they generally get what I'm after now. You know, I I never fail to to tell them if they come to a reading that like it's going to be incredibly filthy, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it's just fiction, yeah. just fiction, mom and dad. Um, is there a Thai stereotype about getting to America and the kids become X? Uh, I, I was at a trade show last week where Bobby Jindal, um, the former governor of Louisiana, that asshole, yeah, yeah, admitted that his parents never forgave him for not getting an MD, yeah, and becoming a doctor, right? And, yeah, you know, yeah. Looking back, maybe that would have been best for everybody, but yeah. But anyway, uh, no. I mean, my sister's a doctor. My my dad is a doctor. My mom was a nurse. Okay, so uh, it is the, the same. Yeah, my sister married a doctor. <laughs> like, and in a way, like, great. She covered all my bases. You know, she had kids. I don't have to do any of that stuff. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a pan East Asian stereotype about this stuff and, and South Asian, uh, about, you know, either working with computers, being a doctor, being a lawyer. Um, and my mom swears up and down that she never said this, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Like, uh, she did, uh, I, I remember her telling me that, you know, she's, I could be whatever I wanted as long as I had an MD at the end of my name, right? <laughs> Uh, and it was a joke. It's obviously a wry joke. But we, we've making. got the Jewish thing with, you know, my son, the doctor is drowning. You know, it's, right. it's, you know, the, as Jews, we've got this too. So yeah. But, uh, at the same time, there are also really, uh, accommodating and open minded in a way that, you know, the stereotype doesn't, uh, let on. Like they were very strict about my studying and, and getting good grades. Uh, I think once I got into Stanford, they're, they're just like, okay, he's, he's our fine. work is done. Right. Yeah. And they let me do whatever I wanted to do, really. Um, you know, they did encourage me to be, be in a profession that was self-sufficient. They, they paid for my tuition, so I felt like I didn't have, I wasn't entitled to, uh, uh, just go off and, you know, throw it into the furnace of a complete degree or something. Yeah. Um, so I studied something called symbolic systems at Stanford, which is anywhere else would be called cognitive sciences. Um, uh, and I, you know, concentrated in uh, human-computer interaction, but I also wrote both my theses on uh, video game design um, because that's what I'm interested in. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, there are writers who uh, believe that you have to transgress and disappoint a lot of people in order to prove that you're a truly free brave outspoken uh, novelist um i think that there is uh you know there's certainly uh it's not worth it to me uh to uh, like harm people that have done nothing but support me uh for the sake of pursuing my writing which is not to say that i don't write it to begin with just that i don't publish it right mm -hmm. I, i've got a you know 300 pager throbbing on my hard drive right now uh that is you know i hope nobody reads <laughs> right uh because it's it's nasty uh and i just won't publish it one of my favorite cartoonists i recorded with last year told me she's got a a drawer full of the the posthumous mk brown comics <laughs> you know those are the one, after she's gone you can you can publish these it'll be fine right. in fact philip lope just a few weeks ago you know like, i could write my memoir but i need a few more people to die yeah, first, right. Before uh, before that goes, I'll just put like a dead man switch in my aorta. That'll <laughs> just like you know, I'm gone. Um, this goes out to the press, <laughs> right? Yeah, it will just unleash a locked box with a with a <laughs> pirate map in it or something. Nice. So you really don't want to be the voice of your generation. This is what you're really getting at here. I'm just kidding. It's um, <laughs> but what aspect? Given that the book took a number of years to to write, and you began it at that that in your mid early to mid twenties. How did it change and how did you change over the, the 
span of that? You're still writing about a relatively static time, and you're getting more and more distance on it. Yeah. Do you feel that's reflected in the book, or were you essentially going back in and re reinforming as you approach 30, Absolutely. and as you see yeah. the, the way your no, life was the, changing? The perspective was totally crucial. Uh, no, it was useful to have distance from your characters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because then you can uh, uh, approach them and write them as discrete individuals, right? Uh, instead of just like protuberances out of your body, right? Um, uh, I think that, A, you just get uh, better as you keep on writing uh, this, and which feels That's frustrating. That's always the case, but go, go on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it feels frustrating uh, because you feel like you're standing on quicksand, right? That mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you have perfected the later part of your book and you realize that dry rot has set into like the begin beginning part and it's way worse than the, you know, when you've gotten a, b a better idea of, of the project and your, your style is like congealed. Um, uh, then you have to go back and then like the ending part is worse. And then you mm -hmm. sort of uh, run back and forth and until you die. Right. Um, but uh, it was also important because uh, the first parts, there's a lot more indignation in the early drafts. Uh, like a lot more anger, vitriol, and contempt um, that people picked up on. You know, when I went to Iowa with it, um, I had the first three chapters in hand. Um, and, uh, you know, when I workshopped it, uh, Sam Chang, the director of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, she was the instructor. She said she had never seen a, a workshop more bloody than the one that I got, right? Um, it was, it was me and uh, Tony Mara. Uh, he wrote Constellation of Vital Phenomena. Um, and we were in the same class, both named Tony. Um, uh, and, you know, his workshop went up first. It got massive raves, as it has ever since, you know. Um, and then um, my thing came up, and it was... Uh, people thought it was just like vile hipster trash, pretty much. They thought they were pretty confident that what I was doing was uh, creating a bunch of really flat, shallow uh, millennial stereotypes uh, that I was uh, standing over and poking fun at, yeah, mocking, um, yeah. right? You know, and and that I was embarrassingly, uh, ingenuously implicating myself, right? And I rejected this for a long time, you know, uh, and. Uh, I I sort of wrote it off to myself by saying, you don't understand it. it like this is this is self loathing that's being expressed, not my authorial loathing for his characters, right? Uh, but uh, you know, I realized what they were getting at eventually, which was that there was not that much distance from between the narrator and the characters. They sounded the same. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, the characters sounded the same, which made it sound like it was a, a narrator laying judgment on these people, it was a craft issue, right? So once I got a better sense of each character's individual voice and made it uh, clearer that uh, the sort of anxiety, guilt, self-hatred was uh, emanating from their uh, consciousness, right? Uh, it became a lot easier. I, I started hearing that less, right? But still, you know, when you write about a maligned category, uh, a kind of silly category of people, like, you know, people in their 20s, uh, right now, millennials, um, it, you know, you are, are automatically going to be seen as a satirist, right? Which I think is a totally false uh, uh, category for this book. And it's one that's it's a, it's a label that's been attached to it a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, what would you describe it as, other than a novel? It's a novel, yeah. yeah okay. I mean, it's a comic. It's a comic novel. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, a comic novel in which the characters are not necessarily uh, flatteringly portrayed, right? Uh, but that's not satire, right? right. Uh, I'm not trying to um, make these characters uh, anti-paragons, right? Um, I think that there's like a lot to, to like and admire in each character, or at least to sympathize with, yeah. right? Um, and you have the absolutely hysterical moment when one of the characters descends into a bipolar episode without his quite realizing it, which uh, I just found hysterical, possibly from, <laughs> you know, my own wacky experiences around yeah. friends, but yeah. Right, but, you know, yeah. this is... Uh, all this stuff that is um, comic 
uh, all the vituperative uh, writing about these characters. I think I tried to build in as much as possible uh, a strong basis for it all so that the, more, the deeper you dig, the more that you can actually um, uh, understand. Uh, and the characters and not yeah, caricatures. The so so yeah. the most obviously satirical character in the book is Vanya, right? Uh, Vanya is this uh, paraplegic uh, you know, young woman who's extremely hot and um, is able to sort of cannily leverage this into uh, an internet live cast that's got a lot of venture capital funding behind it. And um, it would be really easy to lampoon, as, you know, as in, in parts she, she is this figurehead for vapid, approval-seeking, self-obsessed, uh, but also extremely like, strategic and false mm -hmm. uh, internet persona, right? Um, at the same time, you know, um, where does this hunger for attention and ex external validation come from? Uh, she is, uh, you know, raised by two parents who, uh, one of whom uh, shames her for her uh, appearance, you know, uh, and the other who forces her to um, do child pageants, you know, to present this way and to understand it as the basis of her parental love, like way before she's ready for it. <laughs> Um, and this is in fact what, you know, the reason why that, why she becomes paraplegic. Um, and, you know, taken in this context, it's still written kind of like a comic way. Uh, but, um, I don't think that you can hate her, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't want uh, anybody to really, uh, hate characters in my book without qualifications, right. Without feeling like they have some skin in the game too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a complaint that in my old job, coworkers had when I would for certain novels on them, particularly London Fields uh, by Martin Amis. I didn't right. like any of these people. I had to stop reading it after 50. I was like, I understand that. That that makes sense. So <laughs> you're, you're not reading for the same reason I'm reading. That's that's cool. Yeah, but you know, yeah. like Martin Amis, who, who I love, like yeah. uh, uh, not without reservations, right? Yeah. Uh, but he is uh, uh, a gargoyleist, you know? Yeah. He, he makes really, really ugly characters, and that is the basis for a lot of the energy and fascination behind yeah. them. Um, you're not really supposed to to fully humanize them, right? Uh, you're supposed to you're yeah. supposed to like them the same way that you like Humbert Humbert, right? And the incandescence of prose is one of those you know things that'll for me uh, you know cover over a lot of the other the other issues you know that normal readers might have. Yeah. Um, did you find yourself obsessively checking Amazon sales figures? Obsessively check everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Before social media, uh, that was back when I was in small press publishing, again, late nineties, early aughts. Uh, that was the, you know, constantly hitting refresh thing. Now, of course, it's, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. Yeah, uh, there's an app for this now. It's called Novel Rank. It yeah, literally see. tells you when your last book was sold, like what last copy of your book was sold. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that I, it, it's not an ego thing for me anymore. You mm -hmm. know, at, having written, you know, having just been subterraneous for so long um, and uh, working on a book, like the external validation stuff feels nice, uh, but it's nowhere near enough t to get me to keep on writing. Um, you know, I, I am still fascinated by these figures, but uh, for less like sort of morbid reasons than existential self-justification, right? Uh, I, I check them because I'm always interested in seeing uh, what gets people curious about somebody else or a person or me, right, uh, in particular. This, you know, when I write an, uh, an essay, uh, I always check my website traffic and my book sales and see, like, did this shift yeah. units? You know, uh, and it's not because I, you know, I'm taking it as feedback so that I can gear more of my writing towards that, but because, you know, I want to see where my sensibilities actually overlap with just, like, the general prurient interest, mm -hmm. right? Um I, uh, it's, it's not at all useful to me as a writer, but it's like a, it, it satisfies my curiosity about it and yeah. usually reinforces my cynicism. Nice. Yeah. I do that with the, uh, downloads of the show. Yeah. Honestly, I, I was telling, uh, Jeff Nonakawa a couple of weeks ago, uh, another guest on the, the show. I literally have no grasp of what's going to be a popular episode versus not. Yeah. And it, it was one of those where this summer, um, David M. Carr, not David Carr, the one who, who wrote for the New York Times, a uh, book on the possibility of communal traumatic origins of the Old and New Testament. Wow. Teacher, a professor at Uni uh, Union Theological Seminary. Okay. 
It's like, well, Yale University Press pitched me the book. Sounded interesting. I'll drive up and interview the guy. But, you know, God knows who's going to be interested in this. One of the most downloaded episodes of 2016. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what anybody's Get out there off, listening right. for. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, this is it's the saddest thing in the world, I think, when people do try to calibrate uh, their writing to see, uh, you know, to get it to move as much as possible. Yeah. And then they move further and further away from um, the parts of their interests and their personality that don't fit into this mold. And uh, they end up very often not succeeding, right? So, you know, in the in the Pascal's wager, this is the worst possible outcome, right? You yeah. both didn't write exactly what you wanted to write and it's not doing well. Um, and, uh, you know, at the very least, I can say that stuff that I'm working on is generally stuff that I actually care about. I still write for money. I still write yeah. content pieces um, when I need the money. Um, and I think that my philosophy is that I'll just try to bury it under quality, right? <laughs> nice. Um, you also teach. As I do a as, lot, yeah. yeah. Um, what did you learn from writing by teaching? Um, what are the worst tendencies of writers that you, you instruct without naming names? <laughs> I think that teaching put an extremely fine point on uh, my hatreds of certain like incredibly common tendencies in writing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I always tell my students that like I'll fail them if they abuse an aphora. Uh, you know, starting the same uh, one line after another with the same words. Right. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. We're like, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them on the blah blah. blah. I mean, we are fed uh these like orations and these like sort of passages as examples of strong writing i can understand why people fall into this and they see it as like automatically investing their writing with this weight gravitas and, yeah. and weight and and you know hollow ponderous rhythm um and it's just like a pox in the in the workshop circuit you know uh, i see it in every other manuscript uh, mm -hmm. that i read uh you know, to, to some extent, some people, that's the, their entire style. Um, and, you know, it's, it's always going to be a losing battle, right. To, to make this very Epicurean kind of, a uh, uh, dainty, uh, uh, argument against a rhetorical device. But, uh, it, it's, to me, this is just part and parcel with making people uh, aware of the moves that they're doing and the effect that it's having on a reader, right? Um, and I can name a, like a lot of other quirks like this that uh, that bother me. But you know, they don't bother everybody. That's fine. Uh, and everybody else has their, you know, I, I'm sure I embody a lot of pet uh, uh, other writers' pet peeves, right? Like I know for a fact that uh, Jonathan Franzen thinks that I use overly interesting verbs. Um, <laughs> And, you know, yeah. yeah, and it's something that he criticized me for, like in an email and in an interview that he gave to somebody else. Uh, uh, and yeah. that's fine. No, I mean, like he liked my, my book and yeah. I, I was really flattered uh, by that. And it's just not something that I'm going to change, you know, vice versa. Like he he hates when people use the word then uh, in a in a sentence. Yeah. I think it's fine. You know, uh, I think and then is usually not uh, necessary, but then there's plenty of good uses, reasons to use then. And he's confident that you should never use it. So, you know, uh, to each their own, uh, the more that you can articulate uh, these values in a context like teaching, uh, you know, the more that conscious you'll be when you're applying them yourself, right? You write and you say, I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I want to practice what I preach. And, uh, and you do it. Or, you've, or you realize that you've been spouting a line of bullshit and... Uh, Turns out this is actually a good trope to use, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's exception in everything, and fiction is just built on exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the good stuff is anyway. Are there books or essays or stories you assign at all, or is this again generally just a workshop environment where you're you're working off of there? Oh, I always so. yeah I have a little like lecture module at the beginning of yeah. classes, and um, you know I start by making students read line by line. Uh, uh, a Raymond Carver story called One More Thing. Not because I think that Raymond Carver is a paragon, even of a minimalism, um, but just that when you write uh, uh, in such a lean fashion, it becomes extremely easy to parse out the decisions behind each line and 
the elisions mm-hmm. that are made, uh, you know, that other writers would, would fill in, right? Um, I teach Flannery O'Connor, uh, a story called Good Country People, um, and uh, ZZ Packer's story called Brownies, which is amazing. Uh, just like such a great example of Swift characterization. Um, Philip Roth, I teach uh, The Conversion of the Jews for dialogue. Um, and you don't use deception? I'm just kidding. That's, that's, <laughs> again, going, going into the deep cuts of Philip Roth on deep that cut, one. <laughs> deep crate cuts, yeah. right. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff. Um, you know, I, I teach a lot. I teach independent sort of uh, study stuff. I teach for low-res MFA programs. I'm teaching for the UMass MFA right now. Um, and for Catapult and Sackett Street as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, just I try to read the room and figure out what students are interested in learning and straw pulling them when necessary to, to figure out what we should be talking about. But yeah, I like doing old stuff. I, you know, I, I teach, I just taught, um, the death of Ivan Ilyich by uh, Tolstoy. And then, um, you know, next week I'm teaching, uh, a story by my friend that's going to be in a book that hasn't, isn't even out yet, um, called especially heinous 272 views of law and order SVU. Um, you know, which is just one of the best, sort of like magical realists pieces of writing and long writing um, that have been in such a long time. It's like so good. Worst slash most venal atmosphere of the ones you've been involved in New York publishing and writing Silicon Valley or academia. This is a variant of something I asked Thomas Dolby a couple of months ago. So. Yeah. So yeah. this is like a, a three way Venn diagram, right? There's a lot of overlap mutual overlap between each of those, those component dyads, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Silicon Valley and New York Publishing are connected by money, you know. Um, uh, New York Publishing and the MFA circuit are connected by labor, right? Or the kind of like creative labor. And it's a purely, purely like a uh, uh, spurious binary to like, you know, put them in opposition to one another, right? There's, there's so moving in the same direction. I think of it as, you know, rungs headed down and which one is the lowest, but, but sure. <laughs> Into Malibu's, in right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, what has the most uh, uh, toxic atmosphere? I don't know. I think that it's just, it's hard to be happy when you get people together. <laughs> you know, uh, each one has its own um, status symbols and and systems of valuation um, that are just designed to make most people feel awful about themselves. Um, I think that it's perfectly valid. And in fact, I encourage people to, to game the systems uh, when available, you know, when they're, when they're able to, as long as they're uh, taking a broader view and using, availing themselves of whatever position or privilege they have to help other people who, who don't have it. Right. Uh, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, writing, I would say, is, uh, you know, as, as tainted and influenced by uh, nepotism as any other field, but uh, is one where, at the very least, you're doing the work by yourself, mm-hmm. right? And that, uh, you know, if you write uh, stuff that's going to move and uh, stuff that's going to pander to a readership, then... Uh, you're eventually going to pay the price for having spent so much time on that, right? Um, I think it's sad when people convince themselves that, you know, um, working toward uh, an externally established set of criteria, value, and uh, uh, of literary merit, um, are they're able to internalize that so deeply that they convince themselves they're, that's what they really want to do, like I did, right? What was the book or author? Who who really got you thinking? Yeah, I got to be a writer. The book or author? Yeah, was there a, a book or a, a particular author who you? Oh, the book or author? Oh, sorry, okay. not not book. Which is almost as bad as when I interviewed Irvin Welsh, uh, the guy who did Train Spotting, and yeah. thought he talked about a book called The Busking Doctor, until I realized it was The Bus Conductor, and that's what Scottish <laughs> does to you, as opposed to my you know slurring my words. Uh, but yeah, was there a, a book when you were when you were younger that set you on this path? Yeah, probably. Yeah, uh, my friend Jenny. Uh, lent me a book called um, 1982 Janine mm-hmm. by uh, Alistair Gray. Uh, and it was really not like any other book I'd read. It's about uh, a, a Scottish businessman or uh, 
I think he's a business, businessman and he's just in a hotel room having a variety of like really trashy sexual fantasies uh, uh, before killing himself. Uh, and it ends up being uh, at the same time, like not something that it would ever become fashionable because it's like so uh, ugly and um, sloppy in like in certain regards. But uh, uh, that is nonetheless incredibly like entertaining and unique. And um, yeah, that, that was a big book for me uh, in terms of like getting, figuring out what I wanted to do with my own writing. Um, you know, I, I think that writers with strong opinions uh, have always influenced me a lot. Like Zadie Smith's essays uh, inform my sensibility a lot. Um, and uh, I was really, really into David Foster Wallace um, as, you know, a, a lot of like, you know, we'll uh, say your generation. No, like, oh, no, okay. I mean, like oh, specifically sorry. dudes who are, uh, even better, yeah. uh, you know, who think of themselves as, you know, uh, a little bit smarter than the vulgar masses. This is something that I, I hope that I've outgrown. Um, but, uh, you know, he's also a great writer. I mean, it, it's, it's not fair to him, uh, to, uh, to castigate him for the purposes to which other people put his writing, sure. right? Um, Do you find yourself deliberately trying to escape the influence? And we talked about Harold Bloom before we started. Um, that sort of, um, well, yeah, escaping that that influence to, to try to find your own voice. Was he, you know, a significant one in that respect, almost in a negative way for you finding yourself as a writer? Harold Bloom. Uh, Foster Wallace. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah. It's Bloom's concept of of uh, creative agon, where you're you're fighting against some strong precursor, right? Yeah, yeah misprision, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. and all uh, that Kabbalah stuff he does, but whatever. That's that's you know, I'm just doing my layman's reading of it all. Yeah, so. not really. You okay. know, I mean, I, I think that for a while, uh, uh, sometimes you get this you know virus in your bloodstream, and you start sounding a, a lot like another writer for uh, a while. But the more that you uh, keep on reading and writing, the more very your influences become and the less susceptible you are to any particular one you know you get a kind of like personal herd immunity right <laughs> um and you're where you're, you're immunized against one writer by a thousand others right um it's like the, the opposite of homeopathic that's, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so uh you know i uh i think that uh i'm less i'm way less affected by individual writers uh, now, just because I feel like I'm just a, a hodgepodge of a, a lot of influences, right? Which is a good place to be in. Uh, I think that when you think about it this way, um, matters of individual style are not like, oh, I'm conjuring a new voice uh, out of thin air and out of the breath of our Lord, the Savior, you know, uh, but just, you know, uh, an intelligent curation of uh, stuff that you've taken in and thought about a lot, you know? Uh, which I think that if when when writers are not being extremely full of themselves, you know, if they're being honest, they'll acknowledge that this is you know mainly what their their style is. Um, so you know, in that sense, I I kind of agree with um, uh, uh, Harold Bloom in in the way that people uh, you know use their influences uh, to inform their writing, but not in quite such a you know. Uh, Divine heroic lineage. style, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> not such a, a, a patriarchal divine lineage. Divine lineage. It's okay to believe in greatness. It's, it's all right, <laughs> <laughs> Tony. And I'm going to say your name correctly. Tulatamuti. Tulatamuti. Yeah, pretty close. Oh, okay. Well, I, I try. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memory thanks, Show. This is great. And that was Tony Tulatamuti. I really enjoyed his debut novel, Private Citizens. Um, you guys know how hard I am on any authors who are younger than me. Uh, so that is exceedingly high praise uh, for what it's worth. Uh, visit his website, TonyTula.com, to find out more about Tony's writing, uh, readings that he's doing, his teaching, uh, tutorials that he does, etc. And that's T-O-N-Y-T-U-L-A.com. He's also on Twitter and Instagram as Tony Tula. 
Now, I want to thank Garrett Zecker again for connecting us. I am so glad when listeners get the show and, and help me program it without making, you know, dumb suggestions like, you should get Stephen King and Oprah Winfrey, which I have, in fact, been told by people. Um, anyway, once we wrapped up the main session, I did ask Tony, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, and it's pretty entertaining, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show, and that'll get you access to our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode. Uh, we're just getting ready to launch a series of ebooks. if I can just slow down a little bit with everything else and figure out how to do that process and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this one was recorded at Tony's apartment in Brooklyn, so that involved a bunch of tolls, but I did find street parking, so, so that was cool. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, etc., then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with prize-winning illustrator John Cuneo, whose new book, Not Waving But Drawing, just came out from Fantagraphics Underground. Till next time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way.